So then uh, we are ready for uh, this lecture and uh, first I want to present quite fast the solution for assignment number two. It was evaluated this weekend and you have all got some comments to your uh, uh, your answer but I will uh, will go through the solution and uh, shortly explain the how to solve an, an answer to the different problems. Then we will continue on uh, inventory theory and uh, we started last week uh, with the uh, inventory theory uh, when the demand is so-called deterministic or at a fixed rate so we will finish that part and also if we get time we'll continue on uh, uh, the so-called stochastic inventory theory when the, there are uncertainty about the demand you don't know exactly the, what the demand will be but you have an idea about the expected demand and also the variation of the demand. But first, solution for uh, assignment number two. And uh, first, problem A, we should use the data from 2002 and three to create a model, Winter's uh, method uh, for forecasting. And as you remember, Winter's method will uh, both consider the trend and also seasonal differences. And this is uh, uh, a very typical seasonal product, which is uh, usually uh, well used to a high, high degree for Christmas present. As you can see, that uh, it has a very much higher degree in November uh, demand in November and December than for the remaining part of the year. So first, the uh, the model needs to be initialized, and we need to find the G zero, the gradient, the initial gradient, and this is defined to be the uh, how much the trend line will increase from one month to the next. So we find the average for the second year minus the average for the first year and divide by the number of periods, the number of months. And then when we know the gradient, we can also find the S0, the value of the series. This is a situation where we we can uh, assume that we have a graph looking like this, and we have the year 2002 and three, and we want to use the data in this period to create this model. So we will try to find the point, the S0, which is here, and the gradient, which is the expected demand or the expected uh, change of demand from one period to the next. Uh, and then we want to use this information to create a forecast which is continuing for the, uh, the, the whole 2004, the whole, all the 12 months in the next year. Uh, but we also need to adjust for, uh, uh, for the period, adjust for which month, so we need to find out how many percentage of the expected trend line, which is shown here, do we expect to have in January, how many percentage in February, and so on for December. So we will continue the line with the same gradient for the all the 12 months, but we need to adjust for the percentage. So we might have, so, uh, have a, a forecast which uh, looks like this. The, uh, the seasonal factors will decide how, uh, how far away from the trend line each month, the forecast for each month will be. Uh, and then we can use this to, to adjust the, the forecast, find the, the exact forecast for the months. So here, the solution, which is also uploaded in Fronter, will show the different formulas to use. We find that the G0 is 6,500, so we expect an incre increase of 6,500 per year, uh, per month, sorry, in uh, uh, in all, all these months here, uh, on the trend line, and the S0, the value of the series, is found to be 309,000. Then use this formula, where we remember that we need to find the seasonal factor for all the 24 data points which we are using for uh, initializing the series. 
then we will find the seasonal factor by dividing the exact demand shown here by the expression here the vi is the average for that particular year so vi will be the average of 2002 for all these 12 points and the average of 2003 for all these three points then minus n plus 1 which now is 12 plus 1 divided by 2 minus j and j will now be the number of the period 1 2 3 up to 12 and then for the next year we will change the average and then start counting from 1 to 12 again so g is the counter for the month and v will be the average for that particular year so all these uh, numbers are uh, also, uh, well, I used an Excel sheet for, for calculating, so an Excel sheet is also uploaded in front of so you can have a look at, uh, at this, how, how this is solved. Find the seasonal factor for each data point. Find the average between these two, the average for January, the average for February, and so on. But then, when we are summing up, we can find that this is not exactly 12, so we need to find the normalization factor, which is 12 the number of periods divided by this number, which makes a normalization factor of 1.06. And then we have to multiply each of these values by this number. And then we can see we have seasonal factors for all 12 months, which sums exactly up to the total number of, of periods, which is 12. And then we can use the formula here for the forecast. S0 plus this tau and this tau will describe how many month, uh, month in advance we want to uh, forecast. So when we are forecasting for January, this number is 1. For February, this number is 2. For March, it is 3 and so on. So we will continue on this line here by adding G0 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 times for the exact number of, uh, of periods we want to, to forecast in, in advance. Uh, but then, of course, we also need to adjust by the seasonal factor. And this is important, that the seasonal factor needs to be the sa for the same period, for the same month, that you are going to create the forecast for. So if you are forecasting for January, this has to be the seasonal factor for January, and, and so on. Uh, then, using the seasonal factors here, we can find the forecast shown here. And we can also compare with the exact uh, demand for, uh, f for uh, uh, the exact demand for 2004, because we now also have this data in, in, the, uh, in the problem description. So we can see what is the deviation from between the forecast and the actual demand. And we get a uh, um, uh, mean average deviation of 175,229, which can be compared, uh, uh, can be used when we are comparing to other ways of, uh, of forecasting. Uh, and that is what we will do in problem B, because then we have smoothing constants. We will use this Winters method and update the forecast every month, every period, and we have smoothing constant given the values of 0 0.1. So now we want to update the estimates of the series, the gradient and also the seasonal factors for each month in 2004 when the demand of the previous month is known. So now we don't, we, we don't want to forecast for the full year, but we will forecast for January, which means that the forecast for January will be exactly the same in problem A and B. But then, when we know the demand for January, we should update all the parameters used in Winter's method. Because we can, maybe we have that forecast here, and then we experience that the actual demand was lower, which means that we have to adjust the value of S. It was supposed to be here, but it might no, because of the lower actual demand, we need to adjust it so it might be here. And also, the G, the gradient, will then need to be adjusted. And 
the seasonal factor might also need to be uh, adjusted when you get new data points. So for every month, update the values for these three uh, parameters, the series, the gradient, and the seasonal factors. Use the formula shown here, which describes the, uh, uses the smoothing constant, alpha, beta, and gamma, which describes the uh, importance of the last measured demand compared to the last forecast. And then we will we'll get new values, which can be used by this formula to make a forecast for the next period. And now we will only forecast for one period at a time, so that means that we will add S and G, the series and the gradient value, uh, add them together and multiply by the seasonal factor. And what is important, use the seasonal factors you have found in the initialization phase, not the updated one. Many of you have uh, made, uh, well, uh, solved the problems wrong and used this value. But if you try to think logical, uh, you cannot actually use this one when forecasting because you don't know it. You don't know it until you have updated the forecast uh, or updated the, the parameters. So when you are forecasting for February, you know the value for January, but you don't know the new seasonal factor for February. So here, you should use the seasonal factors, which was found in problem A. <coughs> <coughs> but uh, still, you should update the seasonal factors because you need them later in the last sub-problem when you are going to make a new forecast for 2005. <coughs> so here, this is also taken from the Excel sheet. New values using the formulas, update the S and the G values, uh, update the C, uh, C values and uh, uh, normalize again after the full year. And then you find the forecast shown here, update every month and you have a much lower MAD, mean average deviation, when forecasting this way, updating every month. And the reason is, of course, that this problem, this uh, product, will have a decreasing trend, as we will see uh, in, in a short while, and the forecast for the full year is not able to identify this trend, but the forecast month for month will see that here you will have a lower and lower uh, expected demand for each month because this product is maybe it is uh, well, over the top. Maybe there are some new uh, products uh, uh, which is competing and maybe better product which is now in on the market and so on. So this product has had its top probably in 2003 and is now uh, declining interest for this product. So this is now the answer for C. We have the graph here and we can see that the forecast from A is in this line which is rather high. The actual demand is the pink color here which is lower and we can see that the yellow forecast which is the month for month forecast is much closer to the actual demand than the blue forecast which was for the, the full year. So we are asked about what will happen when the smoothing constant change values. First 0 0.2 and then 0 0.05, both a higher and a lower value. And uh, well, I haven't actually shown uh, in, in this uh, document, but in, in the Excel sheet, it's very easy to change the value of the smoothing constant and, and get updated uh, uh, forecasts. Uh, what will happen is that when you have a high smoothing constant, the importance of the last demand is much higher. Uh, so you will be able to identify this uh, declining trend uh, easier uh, than if you have a low smoothing constant. And we can also look and compare the MAD for these two values, and we get 67,879 when you have a high of 0 
and you get 120,593 if you have a low. So this will be closer to the forecast for the full year because the forecast will be more important than the last demand and this will be closer to the last uh, demand and it is actually able to identify the trend. So uh, by using a high smoothing constant you can find a trend but also you must remember that uh, you have uh, this is this demand is uh, uncertain and it might vary so if you have a very if you can call it a bad uh, measured uh, value for for one month it will be given more importance than it might uh, deserve. So exactly the value of the smoothing constant uh, it's not easy it might be different in different problems and in different markets but you should know about uh, what uh, the, the value means that a high value will give a higher importance to the actual demand and a low value will give higher the uh, higher uh, importance to the previous forecast so in problem E, go back to s values of 0 0.1 and show a graph with the values of the gradient during 2004. What you can see here is that it is declining. From February, the value of the G, the gradient, is getting lower and lower for each month until December, where you have a small, yeah, at least it, uh, it, it is a bit higher than in November but not very much but what is also maybe the most important to know by looking at this graph is that the trend is still increasing in this period even if the value of the gradient is getting lower the trend is still increasing until this point then the gradient will get a negative value which means that the trend is decreasing so what is happening you have this trend line going here and then for every month it's getting lower and lower and then in July it's getting negative. So this is the most uh, obvious uh, uh, conclusion by looking at, uh, at the graph and the, and the values of, of the gradient here. So problem F, use the data available by the end of 2004 to make a forecast for 2005 and then show the MAD and comment on the result. And here we should use the same formula as in problem A. We need to find the S value and the G value and we need to multiply by the number of months in advance to forecast. We will, should not update month for month. We should use the data available by the end of 2004. So we have values for S and G. Make a forecast for all 12 months in 2005 uh, but you should not initialize the model again as you did in A because now the model is it was in it initialized in 2000 and at the end of 2003 and you had you have updated it for every month so you have actual values by the end of 2004 so you should use these values so in December 2004 you had a S value of 222,104 and a G value of minus 4,131. Which means that you should use these values as the new S0 and, S and, and G0 and create a forecast for 2005 based on these values. And now you should also use the new seasonal factors which was updated in problem B. So there you get the forecast shown here and a total um, MID of 49,208, which is well, quite good. So then the forecast or the demand in 2005 is behaving more or, more or less as, uh, as expected. Not, not a very high um, change of, of the demand here. Okay, that's problem one. Then we jump to problem two about aggregate planning and first we should create a production plan for the company using the chase strategy or the uh, also called the zero inventory strategy and then you should create another one by the constant workforce strategy 
So by looking at this page, you can see that the first thing to do is to find the k factor. And the k factor is the uh, use historical data, look at the number of units produced for a given period. And the number of units produced was 125,000. The number uh, or the average number of employees were 1,000. And the number of working days, 250 during this period, which makes a k factor of 0 0.5. One worker will produce half an item in one day on average. And then zero inventory or chase strategy, find the minimum number of workers needed to meet the demand. And here you should adjust the demand. The demand is given here or the forecast, but you need to adjust the demand by the incoming stock, which was available when you start the planning horizon. So the actual demand to be produced is 6,000. And you also need to adjust by 2,000, which should be on stock at the end of the planning period, according to the problem description. So this is the demand we should meet. And the minimum numbers needed to meet this demand will be this number divided by the number of units per worker, which is the k factor multiplied by the production days in that particular month. So we can find that in January we only need 572, and if we had 1,000 employed by the start of January, we need to fire 428. And then we need to hire some people, and then again in March we need to hire some more, we need to get rid of some in April, hire in, uh, hire in May, and fire someone in, uh, in June. But this is the extreme strategy called the zero inventory. It should always adjust the number of workers according to what do you need to produce. So you can find the number of units produced. And here we are only using uh, integer numbers. We have only full-time position for the workers which means that you have some inventory in excess anyway, even if you're aiming for having exactly zero inventory. But this is not, not very much. A total of 111 here. And to find the costs, sum up the number of hiring, 955, and multiply by 400, which is the cost of hiring one person. Sum up the number of firing, multiply by the cost of firing one person, and add the size of the inventory, which is 111, but also 2,000, which was described as to be in at, uh, on stock at the end of, uh, of June, at the end of the planning period. So this is now the cost of this plan, 1,344,040. So it's still in the parentheses here, it's possible to adjust looking at the inventory and adjust to get even uh, closer to zero here. Maybe you don't have to hire one person, but this is, uh, is uh, not included, but it's possible to reduce the cost to 1,340, 760. Slightly less here. Uh, on the other extreme strategy, which is the constant workforce strategy, we are aiming for finding out how many workers do we need at maximum, and then we need to have all these workers employed by the full time period. So here, find the cumulative number of units per worker, which is the sum up to each particular month here. Sum up the number of units per worker, uh, and also, find the cumulative demand, how much do we need to produce up to this particular month. Divide this column by this column and find the ratio, how many workers do we actually need up to that point. Then look for the highest number, which in this case is 1030. This is now the critical month, May. 
and it means that we need to have 1030 persons employed in the full time period to meet the, the, the demand in all the months in, in, this, uh, in this production plan. Uh, and we can see that then we will have a very high degree of inventory. So even if we don't have much uh, cost in hiring and firing, well, we need to hire 30 persons because we had 1,000 at the start of the planning period. We need in total 1,030. So these people need to be hired in January. No firing, but the inventory cost will be 21,025 plus these 2,000, which should be on stock. Uh, and since these are included in the demand here, we need to add them to get the correct value for the, uh, for the cost of, of this plan. And multiply by the inventory cost per item, which is 40, which gives a total of 933,000. So, we then will try to find the optimal solution looking or describing an, a linear programming, an LP model for this problem. First, we should describe the constraint sets. And the first set here is the balancing constraint for the workforce, which says that the workforce in one period needs to be equal to the workforce in the previous period plus the number of hiring and minus the number of firing or put all to the left side so w1 minus w0 minus the hiring plus the firing should be equal to zero and this will be for all the six months in this uh, uh, in this uh, plan second constraint set is balancing the production against the inventory level. It means that the production should meet the demand. This is the demand for each of the six months. And the production should meet the demand. And if not, it should be some adjustment to the inventory level. Production plus the inventory level in the previous period is what we have available. And this should meet the demand. And the remaining should then be left as inventory in period number one. And the same for all the other periods here. And then looking at the third constraint sets, uh, which is balancing the production with the workforce. This is the number of units produced by one person in each of the months from January to June. It is the same as we saw in the table. as the number of units per worker, which is the K factor multiplied by the number of days. So these numbers are now used in the LP formulation. And says that the production should be equal to this number, number of units produced for by one worker in the whole month multiplied by the number of workers. And at last, we have some constraints, which is the initial values given in the problem description. It is W0, 1,000 workers employed at the start of the period. I0, number of items on stock when you start, which is 2,000. And I6, number of units on stock, which should be on, uh, should be on stock when the planning period is finished. And since you are using these values here, the inventory in period 0 and 6 here, you should not adjust the demand here. Some of you had adjusted the demand. This will not be correct since they are included here. The inventory level is now uh, directly defined as these two variables with an exact value in this formulation. And then you need, uh, you will adjust the actual demand by using I0 and I6 in this constraint sets. <coughs> so create a LP formulation of the problem and solve it using lingo. Then the LP formulation is all these constraints with the objective value looking like this. 
You want to minimize the function, which is 400 multiplied by the number of hiring in all the months, plus 800 multiplied by the number of firing in all the months, and plus 40 multiplied by the inventory level in all the months. And what we now can see is that we get an objective value of 943,253.8, which is quite strange, because we have already seen a plan for the same problem, which gives us a lower value, 933,000. So here something must be, well, something must be wrong, or something must be different between these two models. And the difference is what we will see uh, later. Uh, well, we can analyze it here, and then we can try to look at the solutions. And then zero inventory, of course, main focus, reduce the inventory in stock, produce demand as it occurs. And then adjust the number of workers, and it will vary very much from one period to another. On the constant workforce, however, we want to have a fixed number of workers for the full period of, uh, uh, of production. So we find the minimum number of workers to be 1,030 and use these num uh, all these workers in the full, uh, in the full planning horizon. Uh, and then we find the LP, which should be the optimal solution, as slightly more expensive than this one. But still, this is the mathematically optimal solution where hiring and firing and inventory on stock is adjusted from one period to another to give the cheapest possible solution. But the reason for the higher cost than the constant workforce solution is that the constraint of a, sock, uh, of a stock is exactly 2,000. This constraint tells us that we should have exactly 2,000 uh, items on stock at the end of June. And this means in June, we need to fire some people in this LP formulation. So if you look at these um, the parameter values, we can see that F6, the firing in June, is rather high of 373,000, uh, no, 373.6264 people. And this firing is necessary to meet the demand of exact 2,000 on stock. But it is rather expensive. So if we relax this constraint, which we will see a bit later, then we will get a much better solution for this LP problem. So first, let's try to analyze now. Uh, we want to judge the effect of the changing costs. And then we first try to find some examples when you have a very high hiring cost compared to the firing and inventory cost. And then examples on the high firing cost compared to the others and the high inventory cost compared to the others. And uh, well, I have mentioned some general views here. This is not uh, uh, extensive, so there you could think of lots of other uh, good examples here. But when you have a high hiring cost, it is typical that this happens in industries which needs a high degree of education and training. It will be quite costly to get and train a person. Uh, and also, this might be typical in an economy with a large economic growth, paired with poorness. China is a good example here. You have, uh, you, you have uh, well, quite uh, large economic growth. You have industry, and you have uh, 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 some pressure on the uh, market or labor market, uh, which might give us some high hiring cost. Uh, the products might not be very expensive, and also it is easy to get rid of people if you don't need them anymore. There are not much unions and, and labor laws, for example. Uh, the opposite, when the firing cost is quite large, is uh, shown here. Uh, typically, Norway, you have a union tradition. It's, uh, it's not easy to fire per persons. Uh, and uh, even if the product have a, a high value, which it they might have in, in several industries, uh, you might have quite large firing costs and, uh, compared to the others. 
And at the end, the high inventory cost is typically when you have very high valued products, airplanes, ships, specialized uh, medical equipments, and so on. And of course, producing and storing these products might be, uh, be quite expensive compared to changing the workforce. So now in problem G, we should use lingo and simulate all the three situations, multiply the weights by 10 for each situation, which means that we first should multiply the hiring cost by 10, keeping the others, and then multiply the firing cost by 10 and keeping the others originally, and then the inventory cost by 10 and keeping the hiring and firing cost as original. And then we find that the first and the second solution will be exactly the same. Don't look at the objective value because the, the objective value is now just a number, but studying the solution, you can see that the exact solution you get, uh, well, the solution you get for these two uh, situations will be identical. You are hiring and firing people and storing inventory uh, exactly uh, as you did in the uh, well, for, for both these two situations. And it is also very close to the constant workforce solution shown in B, because the cost of changing the workforce will be so high that it will not be profitable to do any changes. But then, of course, the inventory cost will be very high. And the third situation, when you have a large inventory cost compared to the others, it will be more like, uh, yeah, Lingo will find a solution with exactly zero inventory, so it is not exactly the same as the zero inventory solution, uh, because here we are counting with fractions, which we were not in, in our manually uh, plan. Uh, but still, it is very close to the zero inventory uh, solution we found in A, because it is so costly to store inventory, so you should rather, rather uh, adjust the workforce. So then in H, we go back to the original model, and then we relax the constraint of exactly 2,000 on stock to say larger than or equal. So we can have at least 2,000 uh, items on stock. And then we will get a solution with an objective value, which is 801,275, which is then much better than any of the other solutions. So this will now be the optimal solution by looking at the, uh, or relaxing the constraints to so say that we should not have exactly 2,000, but we can have at least 2,000. Then you don't have to fire people in June, and it will be much cheaper to produce more than you actually need, so have a larger uh, s uh, storage cost, because the, uh, the firing cost will be so much higher. And again, go back to the original model, add some new constraints, and in this case, assume that the company has 800 permanent workers, which means that you have to add these constraints, that the W parameters should have a value which is higher than or equal to 800, which means that the objective value will now be a bit higher because you cannot fire as many as you did in the original problem. Because in the original problem, I think you had to fire 273 in January. Now, you can only fire 200 because the permanent workers need to be employed anyway. And then the last subproblem, J, suppose that we can have only 100% position, which means all these variables need to be integers. You cannot have fractional values here in the solution. And some of you have used this uh, integer command on all the hiring and the firing, but this is not necessary because if the W variables, the number of workers, need to be uh, integers, then the hiring and the firing parameters also need to be integers because you cannot fire a fractional number and get an integer number. So the g in command on all the w variables will be sufficient in this case. And then we get an objective value which is slightly higher, 943,620. 
which does not differ very much from the fractional solution, but then you have integer constraints and make some adjustment to, to the workforce. It is not exactly identical to the conservative rounding, but it's not very far away. Okay, I think we'll use the first over for the solution here, and then we take a break, and uh, in 15 minutes I will continue on chapter four about inventory control, when you have a fixed demand, and in particular I will look at the situation where you have a possible possibility of discounts.